Hi, it's Dwyer. DwyerCrime.blog. Also, GamblersAdvisory.com. Today is April 4th, 2024. I just had the privilege of watching the current 48 hours on the case of Jane Doritek. Understand, the prosecution, after she served about two decades, the prosecution was about to retry her, and they decided, since they had lost some of the evidence, they decided not to retry her. So Jane Doritek is a free person today. Let's talk about whether we think she did the crime or not. She was accused of murdering her husband. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let me point out what I hope is obvious to subscribers here on YouTube. Right? I am very sympathetic to defendants who, in my opinion, the facts show did not do the crime. Right? There are some defendants I think are guilty. Right? O.J. Simpson, I believe he's guilty. Um, but there are those defendants, Lee Harvey Oswald, who I believe were framed. Right? Look at those videos, dissect them, right? Wayne Williams, the alleged Atlanta child murderer. I don't think he did all the crimes of which he was accused. But I do believe he did some of them. Accuracy is key. I don't have a pro-prosecution bias. Right? I'm actually hoping when I look at these cases to find exculpatory evidence so that I can be reassured that the presentation being made by the defense is credible. Well, let's look here at this case where Jane Doratek first gets convicted for murdering her husband. And then 20 years later, after she wins the right to have an appeal, right? There's DNA evidence that shows that there's unknown male DNA that was found under the fingernails of her murdered husband, right? Very minute amount, but nonetheless, there's a third party whose DNA is under his fingernails. After she wins the opportunity Years later, after years in prison, for a new trial, the prosecution decided not to go forward. Now, let me make a major point here. Understand, when there's a two-decade or so gap in time between an initial conviction and a second trial, right? the prosecution will understand that Memories fade. People retire. Cops leave the force. Right? The prosecution has a major problem on its hands. And I mean major. If part of the case was built on forensic evidence and the chain of custody of that forensic evidence has been broken, some of the evidence has been lost, that's what happens over time. So in my opinion, just early on, let me just say, I don't believe the prosecution's decision not to retry her is any kind of concession by the prosecution that she didn't do the crime. I believe it's more of a concession that time has passed and it would be hard to prove that she did the crime now that some forensic evidence has been lost. Let me also point out, too, that in the 48 hours, and it's riveting if you're in a true crime, Jane Doratek talks. She gives her 
version of what happened, what she was thinking when she spoke with the police, right? They go back 20 years and you see Erin Moriarty in Jane Doritek's home talking to Jane. This is before Jane gets convicted. Jane is open with the press. She's extremely well presented. She reminded me of Rebecca Fenton, another woman who got convicted who, when you see her presentation, her body language conveys innocence. The tone of voice conveys innocence. My first impression looking at Jane Doritek was that she couldn't have done the crime. She seemed outraged that anyone would even think that she did the crime. Right? She, you know, comes across as someone who had a tragedy happen to their family. Her husband murdered out on a jog. She doesn't know much of what's going on and the police in a rush to judgment were trying to pin it on her. Right? That's the image she conveys when she's talking to Erin Moriarty before she's convicted. She's extremely well presented. What I want observers to do here is to look at the post-trial briefing. Right, With my notes, let me just hold it up to the camera. This is the People vs. Doratek. It is a 2003 court decision. Now what's important here is the fact that, and this isn't on the show, in the papers that Jane Doratek submitted after trial to try to challenge the jury verdict, one of her arguments was that the trial court made an error in refusing to instruct the jury concerning the lesser included offense of voluntary manslaughter. Right? Understand, Jane believes that rather than just be charged for murder, she should have also been considered for voluntary manslaughter. Right, folks? Just understand that this position in this court filing is completely inconsistent with the presentation Jane makes on 48 Hours and with her version of events. Let's talk about her version of events. Now, the couple, her husband Robert, have three kids. And they are renting a ranch near Escondido in Southern California. Now, understand, her and hubby were having problems. She made a lot more money than hubby. At one point, they separate and hubby actually files for divorce and seeks spousal support, right? They reconcile. Hubby does not like the fact that Jane is spending as much money as she's spending on her horse habit, right? They have horses at the ranch. Apparently, that's a Jane thing. That's not a Robert thing, right? So the couple has been through some rocky times in their marriage. Jane Doratek admits to it. So they have reconciled. Understand if they divorce, Jane faces spousal support liability. Now, on the evening of February 13th, 2000, Jane starts calling friends. She wants to know if anyone has seen Robert, who, according to Jane's version, she last saw 
when he was preparing to go for a jog at 1 p.m. that day. So hours have passed. And Jane, of course, starts calling Fran saying, hey, have you seen my husband? Now, let's be clear here. Jane is on the property at the time that she wants all of us to believe her husband leaves to go jogging, right? She claims that she sees him. He's all dressed up. He's about to leave and she goes to the barn. And he then, of course, presumably leaves. Then he goes missing. She starts calling friends. She does not call the cops at first. She then hops in her car and goes driving, looking for him. Now let's pivot right here. If your husband leaves at one and he doesn't come back for hours and he's gone jogging, in other words, he's on foot and you live in a hilly area, if he's been missing for several hours, what would you expect to find if you're out looking for him in your vehicle? Right? Understand, if your husband is missing, if something happened to him, if he's laying on the side of the road and needs medical attention, you're better off calling the police, aren't you? She's already, according to her, called her friends and figured out that Robert's not with any of them. But she doesn't call the cops. Let's also be clear, too, on the timing here. I don't believe it's emphasized enough on the 48 hour show. She sees Robert at one. She doesn't call the cops until something like five o'clock. Hours later. You wonder what happened in those hours. Well, let me point out that after the cops are called. They find Robert's sweatshirt on the side of the road. About a half a mile from the sweatshirt, they find Robert's body. Right? The police determined that Robert died from blunt force, injuries to his head, with ligature strangulation as a contributing factor. Now, understand how violent the murder is. According to the 2003 published court decision here, right? In fact, let me back up. It's not published, but we have it. Published has a certain connotation in legal uh, circles that would give it precedential value. Right, just understand you could look up this 2003 court decision yourself. It's part of the record of the case. Robert apparently suffered at least not one blow, not two blows, at least three blows to his head. He had two large lacerations on the right side and the back of the head. He also had skull fractures underneath those lacerations with direct damage. That's the quote from the court decision, direct damage to the brain at the back of his head. Folks, this guy was bludgeoned to death, right? There was a depressed skull fracture on the right side of his head. In other words, whoever killed him leaves no doubt. It's multiple blunt force trauma with multiple fractures and direct brain damage. Now, the police interview 
Jane. Right? She gives them the story that he left to go jogging at 1 p.m. She also told the officers, and this isn't highlighted on 48 Hours, that both her and Robert each had a $250,000 life insurance policy with the other listed as the beneficiary. Well, let me say, the cops then go to Jane's house, the house she shared with Robert. And of course, they find blood stains in the bedroom. The pattern is consistent with a beating. Now understand, the cops are a bit concerned because there isn't enough blood where Robert's body is found for them to believe that he died where his body was found. Right? The head is one of these parts of the body that bleed extensively. When it's punctured, here this guy has multiple skull fractures, uh, direct injury to the brain. You would imagine the guy would bleed out where his body was found. But there wasn't enough blood there. So they go to Jane's house. And wow, here's blood in the master bedroom. The pattern is consistent with a vicious beating. Cops turn over the mattress. Understand there is a huge blood stain underneath the mattress. There's also a folded bloodstained towel between the mattress and the box spring. In other words, someone here was trying to clean up the blood. According to the court decision, there is a syringe in the master bedroom. The 48-hour show differs a little bit from the court decision. We're going to go with the official court decision here. Right? There's a syringe in the master bedroom that has horse tranquilizer in it. And it has Jane's bloody fingerprint on it. So, of course, believe it or not, Jane has an explanation. She wants us to believe that Bob had a bloody nose earlier and that she helped Bob clean up his bloody nose and that the syringe actually pertains to a horse and she may have touched the syringe. Something that has no connection to Bob's murder. She may have touched a syringe before throwing it into the garbage. Right? Leaving a bloody fingerprint with Bob's blood on it. Right? She actually has explanations, right? The blood drops around the bedroom. She wants the police to believe that one of her pets had some kind of bloody injury that started to drain blood everywhere. So she wanted the police to believe that it's the dog's blood not her husband's blood. We know from DNA testing that it's actually her husband's blood, not the dog's blood. The question is, why would she tell the police that it's the dog's blood when most of the blood that the police do DNA testing for comes back positive for her husband? Understand, too, there's a bed sheet found in the hamper with blood spatter on it. There is a steam shampooer and cleaning supplies that were found in the living room closet. Blood was found on the handle, the cup, and the nozzle. In other words, these cleaning supplies were used recently and they had blood on them. 
right? That's inconsistent with the idea that Bob had the nosebleed from hell and that these cleaning supplies were used sometime in the past. Bloodstains were also found in the bed of the truck used at the ranch. Again, DNA indicates that the blood is her husband's. Now, the defense later would argue that not all the DNA, well, put it this way, they would argue that not all the blood was tested for DNA, that the cops took representative samples. In other words, there is blood in different places in the bedroom, right? Between the mattress and the box spring, over by the head of the bed, over by the side of the bed. One of the appellate arguments that won the day was the idea that the prosecution at trial said this blood was Robert's blood. And of course, the defense argued that statement can't be made to a jury because they didn't test every drop of the blood. Just understand, the blood that was tested came back positive for Robert, right? A couple of the drops turned out to not be blood. Understand, too, an expert testified at trial as to a theory on how Bob was killed and relied on two blood spots that were on the blanket on the bed. Those blood spots were not tested. So on appeal, of course, the argument was, gee, these were false statements to the jury. In other words, while there is blood in the master bedroom, and while these blood stains look like every other blood stain in the master bedroom, it was an error to not test those blood stains and then tell the jury that those stains were Bob's blood and to have an expert testify as to a theory on how Bob was killed in the master bedroom. Let me also say too that on Bob's body, there are two blood stains on Bob's boxer shorts. There also is a lot of doo-doo. In other words, poor Bob is literally using the bathroom on himself as he's getting bludgeoned to death. Now, the problem I have with the case is there's no grounds to claim voluntary manslaughter if Jane is telling the truth. If Jane is telling the truth, she sees hubby, he's about to go for a run, they're not having an argument, she doesn't kill him, right? She just sees him, he's about to leave, she leaves to go to the barn, right? They live on a ranch, they have horses. But yet, Jane files papers in court claiming that the court made an error in not allowing her to have voluntary manslaughter as one of the charges. Understand, Jane's position in court is consistent with the parties having some kind of argument, things getting out of hand, her killing him, in the bedroom, using the truck to transport his body along the jogging trail, leaving the body on the jogging trail, then calling a bunch of friends pretending that she doesn't know where her husband is, cleaning up the master bedroom, right? Keep in mind, the cleaning job is so hurried that the police see stuff, it looks damp, then they pick up a part of the rug and underneath the rug had blood stains. So she would have then cleaned up the murder scene. 
then called the police and put on a dog and pony show to convince the cops that she knows nothing about hubby's murder and that when she got to the master bedroom and saw bloodstains, she didn't think they were remarkable. They didn't catch her attention. She just assumed that the bloodstains were caused by her dogs. Right, folks, I just find the Jane narrative to be unbelievable. Let me point out, too, that it's deeply troubling that on 48 hours, and they talked to Jane today, right? On 48 hours, she talks about how she feels her lawyer provided her with ineffective assistance of counsel, right? Jane's throwing everyone under the bus here, folks. Her argument is that there were witnesses who claimed that they saw a man jogging. Another witness claimed that Bob was seen in a car with, you know, two unidentified men. Folks, you know, those arguments really aren't consistent with the forensic evidence. Right, let's think this through. Let's say that someone believes that they saw Bob in a car along the jogging trail with two unidentified men. Are we to believe that after killing Bob that these men then decided, rather than get away and, you know, uh, evade justice, these men then decided to go to Bob's house. These men then decided to clean up Bob's master bedroom. Right? Understand. The cleaning supplies have bloodstains on them. Why would hit men go to Bob's house to clean up Bob's master bedroom? Not only that, Jane is at the house. Why would hitmen go to Bob's house to try to clean up the huge blood stain that's on the mattress? Then decide they're going to hide the blood stain by flipping the mattress and they're going to try to stop the blood from dripping by putting a towel between the mattress and the box spring. Understand the idea that Bob is killed by strangers away from the house simply doesn't make sense. Understand, too, that if there are two unidentified men who were in a car with Bob, and if they then presumably drove back to Bob's house after bludgeoning him to death, right, blunt force trauma, at least three major blows, brain injury in the back of Bob's head, then they leave his body, right, a little bit off the side of the road. Just understand, the blood, of course, shows that Bob's bodies moved there. But more importantly, if the bad guys then drove to Bob's house and decided, hey, let's, let's clean up Bob's bedroom. Let's find a way to get a bloody fingerprint from Bob's wife on a syringe. Understand, even that explanation is deficient because it doesn't explain what Bob's blood is doing in the family truck. Right? Clearly, someone kills Bob at the house, then transports his body out to the jogging trail using the family truck. Right, folks, that's inconsistent with two bad guys. But understand, on 48 hours today, Jane Doratek is pushing that theory. Right, folks, that's as unbelievable as believing that all the blood in the master bedroom was caused by her bleeding dog. Who, by the way, they show on 48 hours. Right? And the dog looks healthy. Right? Keep in mind, it's Bob's blood in that master bedroom. 
right? Once you see the blood on the other side of the mattress, the flip mattress, you realize that that blood was not caused by a nosebleed. You also realize that the alternative theories that Jane is coming up with are inconsistent with her belief that she should have been charged with voluntary manslaughter. Right? Let's talk about another person she throws under the bus. She authorizes her attorney, and you need client authorization for things like this, to accuse her daughter of the murder. In other words, mom's on trial. Let me accuse another family member of the murder. In other words, at trial, the presentation isn't two thugs killed my husband. No, the presentation is that father and daughter did not get along. There was family dysfunction. Daughter shared mom's love of horses. Dad wanted to get rid of some of the animals that daughter loved. So daughter decided to kill father. Folks, that's the presentation that Jane had her lawyer make. We now know that the daughter wasn't even at the house. Understand, Jane today admits on 48 Hours that her daughter had nothing to do with the death of her husband in her mind. So what Jane is telling you is she had her lawyer make a presentation in court. She attended trial that she knew was false to a jury in the hopes of gaining an acquittal. Let me uh, make a couple of other points too. Her two sons. It's astonishing that the two sons would testify against mom. Clearly, there's enough dysfunction in this family for them to believe that mom did the crime. Now, it's important to know that one of the sons passed away. He's no longer with us. But understand, the other son, according to the prosecution, still believes that mom killed dad. In other words, you look at Jane, she looks like a great person, she, you know, seems to be open with the press. Folks, the forensics don't match her story, in my opinion, right? And this is all my opinion, right? In my opinion, Jane Doratag is getting away with murder. The forensics don't match her story. The people who know her best, well, hubby's no longer with us, right? The son, who's the surviving son, of course, believes that she did the crime. He actually testified against her at the trial, right? He portrayed her as the temperamental parent. You see a portion of the testimony on 48 Hours. Let me also point out, too, that the idea that two strange men, you know, accosted her husband when he was jogging on the road, is discredited by the idea that the rope found by Bob's body came from the house. Right, understand, Jane didn't see two strange men at the house. Nobody saw two strange men at the house. We're to believe that the two strange men are at the house. Let's say they kidnap Bob. They decide to take some of the rope at the house. They're going to kill this guy with stuff from the house. Do you believe in kidnapping Bob? They would stop to then clean up the bedroom. It makes no sense. Now the defense points out that the rope found around Bob's body off by the jogging trail doesn't have Jane's DNA on it. But I need for people to think about the sequence of events. Right? If you believe, as I do, that Jane kills him 
in the bedroom, perhaps around one o'clock, then has four hours at least to play with, decides to transport Bob's body out to the jogging trail in the truck, right? There's blood in the truck, leaves the body out by the jogging trail at some stage after murder. She may have thought to herself, let me wear gloves, right? The fact that Jane's DNA is not on the rope that is on Bob's body is not convincing to me, given that her bloody fingerprint is on the syringe found in the master bedroom. So, to sum up, you know, I, I think this is a very intelligent defendant who got into an argument with her husband, the one who had filed for divorce earlier, who she had reconciled with, who she faced the possibility, if they split up, of actually having to pay child support to, since she was the primary breadwinner in the family. She gets in an argument with her husband. Things get out of hand quickly. She kills him. She then goes to trial. The prosecution is tough. They want a confession. They refuse to give her the option of voluntary manslaughter. She gets convicted of murder. She then is upset enough to file papers in court saying, hey, I should have been given the option of a voluntary manslaughter charge. Right, folks, she may have accepted voluntary manslaughter. In other words, her entire story is false. Right, there's a lot of acting here. Right, every criminal thinks they have everyone outfoxed. The problem here is that the blood around the body when it's found by the police isn't enough for his injuries. The problem is when the cops go to the house, they not only see blood in the bedroom, but they see efforts to clean up the bedroom. The only person with an incentive to clean up the bedroom, folks, would be Jane. Not some hitman who has abducted Bob from the house or who has accosted Bob on the jogging trail. The children understand that mom is temperamental. They understand that mom is capable of murder. She tries to throw one of the kids under the bus. She tries to throw her attorney under the bus. Let me just say this too. You know, there are times, I'm an attorney, not a criminal attorney. There are times when clients will tell you things and you understand that what the client is saying is, I am guilty. Her attorney, right, who presumably talked to her, eventually conceded that the murder took place in the family bedroom. But of course, he decided to point the finger at the daughter. Folks, you and I know that that doesn't happen randomly. You don't have a client in a criminal trial and then point the finger at another family member without your client's permission. Right? Just understand, Jane is all over the page here. She sets up a story where she wants you to believe that her husband was accosted on a jogging trail. We're to believe that when she shows up in her bedroom, think about how preposterous this part of her story is. And there's blood all over 
understand the cops show up, that's the first thing they see is blood all over the bedroom. We're supposed to believe that she goes into the bedroom later. It's her bedroom too, right? She goes into the bedroom later. She sees blood all over. And her reaction isn't, let me call the cops right now. Let me report this. Bob's not home. There's blood in my bedroom. He's nowhere in sight. He's on foot. Let me call the police. Something may have happened here. That's not her reaction. Her reaction, according to her, is to hop in the car and to go looking for Bob. Folks, the story here is just not credible. The 48 Hours show is dog and pony. I believe Aaron Moriarty is looking at Jane Doratek and is privately thinking, this woman did this. But also realizes that the prosecution decided not to retry her after she spends two decades in prison. And of course, 48 Hours doesn't want to be confrontational. They want access to Jane Doratek because it's compelling television. Right? I'm just telling you that if you listen to Jane Doratek, even today, her story is not believable. At one point, they have a guy from John Jay University, a criminologist, who claims that, you know, Jane's DNA may have gotten on the syringe because she may have thrown a tissue in the garbage that may have touched the syringe and may have left traces of her DNA on the syringe. How's that possible? When what's on the syringe is a bloody fingerprint. Folks, that's not transfer DNA. That's Jane holding the syringe. Jane herself points out that she helped clean up a bloody nose her husband had days earlier and may have touched this syringe after helping hubby clean up the mess caused by his bloody nose. Right? We know the bloody nose story is nonsensical because of the extent of the blood on the other side of the mattress. Folks, it's so bloody, someone puts a towel there. That's how bloody it is. And of course, we understand that there's an effort to clean up the blood. You know that because there's blood on the other side of the carpet. So Jane's story does not add up. I congratulate her on getting away with murder. Granted, she had to spend 20 odd years in prison, right? But the bottom line is she got out in part because of COVID. I'm sure the prosecution, you know, after um, they granted Jane a new trial, was bluffing and wanted a confession from Jane. Jane, of course, bluffed back and forced the scheduling of the trial, the prosecution realizing that it had lost evidence in the 20-odd years since Jane was in custody, then folded up and decided not to charge her, in part, I'm sure, because of her age. She's now in her 70s, right? And because of the idea that this is a one-off killing. She killed someone in her family. Nobody else might push her buttons the way her ex-husband did. But make no mistake, as I make this video, I don't believe Jane's story at all. I believe the real story is that Jane was hoping for a voluntary manslaughter charge as reflected in the 2003 court decision. Right? Her kids know the real story. Jane here is trying to fool people by talking about witnesses who, you know, supposedly saw someone jogging and someone who supposedly saw hubby in a car with two strange men who, of course, would have no incentive to go to the house, uh, leave blood in the master bedroom, 
um, at a time when Jane, of course, is on the property and clean up the master bedroom. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. If there are facts in this case that you feel are exculpatory, you know, I understand Loyola Law School's, um, you know, exoneration unit uh, looked at this case and helped Jane. Um, you know, I understand if you go online, you're going to see her listed in, um, you know, other uh, exoneration uh, lists and things like that. Folks, her story is not credible. It wasn't credible when she was tried for the murder. It's not credible today, in my opinion. Right? I wasn't there. I don't know what happened to Jane's husband. What I do know is that Jane's story, to me at least, does not hold water. Those are my views. I'm entitled to my opinion in the United States. Those are my views. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Let me also say, too, my first impression of Jane when I started watching this 48 Hours was, wow, this woman could not be guilty. She looked genuinely outraged that anyone would think that she had anything to do with the murder of her husband. Then, of course, they go through the evidence and you realize her story doesn't make any sense. Right? You show up in your master bedroom, you see blood all over the place, and you think, oh, nothing's unusual. Right? You're not phased by all the blood. Right? There's a huge stain on your mattress. Uh, there's a pillow that's, you know, excuse me, a towel that's between the mattress and the box spring. And you're talking about some nosebleed that your husband had. What did he do? Lose a quart of blood in that bed? Then, of course, the cleaning supplies in the bedroom have blood stains on them. Then there's Jane's own bloody fingerprint. Then, of course, there's blood in the back of the family truck. And conveniently, there's a several hour gap between when Bob supposedly goes jogging and when Jane finally calls the police. Right? This is even with blood stains in the family bedroom that stood out to the police early on. And of course, the rope that's found on Bob's body comes from the house. How would two men who accost Bob on his job have rope from the house? Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Also, be aware that I post audio of these YouTube videos at DwyerCrime.blog, which you could also find on Amazon Podcasts. Thanks for stopping by.